So what I'm going to talk to you about is something called gutter tech. This is a term that I use to describe using the lowest common denominator technology to solve any problem. It's an approach that I've taken um, with several different paths in my life. My background is as a fine artist. I'm now a CEO. But 10 years ago, I looked like this. Um, I'm the one with the beard and uh, bent over in a cryptic slaughter t-shirt. Um, since the age of 16, I, uh, I started a band. I was in a metal band for 10 years. I started an art group, and I was in an art group for 10 years. All of those things, before starting a company four years ago, were about trying to find a way to get great people to collaborate with me to pull off things that I cannot do on my own. I learned very quickly that my aspirations were much beyond um, what I could ever accomplish on my own. Skill sets that I didn't have needed to be uh, to sort of honed and, and, and brought in from other people. Um, one of the first things that, that we are known as uh, for Deep Local is a project called Chalkbot. I just want to sort of show you this quickly. Uh, this is a machine that printed thousands of messages that came in over Twitter on the roads of the Tour de France. Um, this machine uh, basically accepted messages, came in through Twitter, printed on the road, snapped a photograph, grabbed the GPS coordinates, and then sent that back to people, allowing people to participate in an event they couldn't otherwise participate in. This machine was built by a team of four people. Uh, of those people, there were two companies. Both companies were run by people with arts degrees, nothing else. Uh, Standard Robot and Deep Local. Built in Pittsburgh, this is in, uh, uh, over at the testing site. This machine is not new technology. It was perceived as new technology. It was not. Uh, it's built from equipment, most of it 10 or 15 years old. There's one computer on board. That's all that's new. Twitter, of course, is new. Um, this machine in the back, the, uh, the crates here are paint barrels that came from a farm in, I think, York, PA. Um, so literally, this is a combination of old and new technology. This is what gutter tech is. It's solving a problem without thinking about if the tool exists yet. It's solving with whatever you know, whatever you're capable of using um, to meet that demand. So what I'm going to show you are, in my experience, uh, ways that I've allowed sort of that passion that I've had in life to breed innovation in the different things that I've done, whether it's as a band, uh, as an artist, or now as a CEO. Um, First, I want you to stare at this. We saw an exercise like this earlier. When you stare at this dot, what starts to happen? The surrounding area starts to disappear. This is the problem with expertise. It's actually a problem that Carnegie Mellon has. When we train experts, we teach people a very, uh, how to restrict themselves, how to restrict their own thinking. That area around it, that's the interesting area. That comes uh, from, from basically obscuring your view. If you're able, let me go back to this for a second, if you're able to squint, at the world around you and see the form of what things can be rather than what you know them to be, that's how you find opportunity, that's how you innovate. If you look at things based on what you know them to be and the rules that you know to restrict them, then you will always create the same thing that's been created before. Do you understand me? Look at the gray area. The gray area is where innovation comes from. So think like an amateur. Um, a lot of this talk is going to be about my role as an artist and how that impacts uh, my role as a CEO. But this amateur uh, gives you the ability to, to think like a child, to play with new things. That is being fearless. If you can look at something and, and ignore that you're not supposed to use it in a certain way, ignore what you've been taught is the way to behave, and think more, uh, more, more like an amateur, you'll be able to innovate. Um, I've ignored rules. I've ignored roles uh, in my personal life, and I've ignored rules in my company's life as well. Uh, it's important to ignore that just because someone comes from a different path, is taught in a, in a very specific way, that that's what they're capable of doing. People can do anything, and our interests are all over the place, right? So allow those interests to happen by allowing people to dissolve the roles that would t traditionally define what they're good at or what they're capable of doing. We play with hardware, we play with software, no one's trained in this. Um, everything is sort of self-taught. The only way you can make something that's self-taught be successful is by being passionate. Uh, one of the things that, that I've often made decisions in my own life and in my corporate life uh, that people would, would not normally make, would see as, as stupid, as uh, uh, erratic. Um, but you have to make those decisions based on what you want to do. And by being passionate about what you do, you'll find people that will surround you uh, that also are passionate about what they want to do. And you'll, you'll deliver greatness as much as you can. So you have to be passionate about something, whatever this is. This is one of my coworkers, Chloe Fung, who's here, making liege waffles, which are amazing waffles if you ever get a chance to make them. Um, in an effort to try to turn my company into something that is not a company, which I will forever try to do, uh, I want to make my company more like my art group, more like my band. So we do things that are obscure. This is Waffle Wednesdays. Once a month or every so often, we bring entrepreneurs, some other startups, you've been there, you've been there, um, into our office, combined with artists, cultural institutions, nonprofits, a lot of our background, and we make waffles. That's all we do. We don't do a sales pitch. There's no presentation. It's just waffles. 
Um, and there's nothing more to it. But we do that because we want to be a part of a community. We want to understand what other people are concerned with and what the problems are that are going on. And if we can help, we will. Um, but we want to learn from artists. Uh, we run a program called the Old and New Media Artist Residency. Uh, this is something that we built with an art group called Encyclopedia, Destru Encyclopedia Destructica, primarily a book-binding art collective. My company primarily working in mobile technology. These are two very seemingly different uh, organizations. Uh, together, we, we, we figured, you know, what we need to do is find a way for artists, like, like I may have used to have been, to have access to technology they don't normally have access to, at the same time of thinking how new technology and old technology can work together. The only requirement is that artists have to come to us with ideas that, that really blend these two and make good use of both our software engineers and Encyclopedia Structica's traditional artists. Um, from that, we've been able to uh, really do a number of things. We've had several successful projects come out of this, but what we do is we take these artists, they work in our space, they're given an engineer, um, and they come up with projects they don't know how to pull off. It's another requirement. They can't know how to build this thing. We don't want them to know. And it has to be something, ideally, that we don't know how to do either. So our engineers try to assist them to understand what is this thing we're going to create, whether it's a ringtone project, alter alternate reality games, or now a secret sort of history project is going on right now in the office. And what we think can happen through this corporate artist residency program is us each sort of gleaning information from one another, knowledge, learning about each other's behaviors. What artists do for people that I work with and myself is allow them to, to refresh us, to keep us amateurs. Because what happens when you work with any piece of technology or any, anything over time, you start to prescribe those rules. Those rules that you, that you think something can or cannot do, you use them to limit your own thinking. So the only way you can tear down those limits <coughs> excuse me, is through adding different perspectives, <coughs> whether it's through your own experience or through the experience of others. So we do that by bringing artists in. What the artists learn are the timetables and the structure and some of the things that, unfortunately, as a business, you have to learn. Um, what this all allows for is a tremendous amount of failure. Um, which we talked about earlier uh, in some of these presentations, which is fantastic. Failure is one of the greatest things you can do as long as you understand how to fail quickly, right? You need to learn through misunderstanding and failure. Uh, what that means is that all learning really comes from uh, executing on an idea. We have a policy, um, not really a policy, we have a practice in place where any new idea, we can all bring new ideas in, and we're a small team of nine people, and we will execute on those ideas as long as we can get it down and distill it to something that we can build in two weeks. It's a new application, it's a new product, whatever it is, we're going to take the smallest chunk of that that we can execute on in two weeks, and at the end of two weeks, we will decide whether or not we want to continue with it. My company's launched in four years probably 16 different projects, of which 14 no longer exist, and we're fine with that. That's a pretty okay success rate for me. This is a project that failed very quickly. Doesn't really matter what it is, but we learned to fail quickly. Don't ask permission. <laughs> So what I'm going to talk about here is uh, the need to think like a deviant. Uh, again, I mentioned my background is running an art group. Uh, I should define that a little more clearly. My art group was what's, what was called a tactical media art group. What that means is we did a lot of interventionist art practice. Uh, I've had cease and desist letters and uh, attacks from um, Kellogg's Corporation. Walmart wanted to put me in jail. Uh, I, the last class I taught at CMU was called Parasitic Media. I, that was literally the last class. We had three cease and desist letters from the 700 Club, the Christian Coalition, and Walmart. It's my second Walmart run-in. Uh, I did a project called fthevote.com, which allowed people to trade sex for votes against President Bush. This was a big, <laughs> in 2004. The Ohio, the Ohio Board of Elections declared they would arrest me on site if I entered Ohio. Um, I, in, earlier than that, we did a project called Recode.com that was a barcode swapping project. They were, these were all projects that were sort of satire or whatever and, and had some political agenda, but that was my arts practice. I spoke at hacker collectives, right? Not, far different from running a, a software company, I tell you. Um, this is us testing out uh, the Chalkbot project in my back alley with real paint. Unfortunately, the actual one does not use real paint. This is still in my alleyway here. Um, but again, to build something in seven weeks, just so you know, and how most companies work, this is, this is not going through much bureaucratic procedure. This is making decisions and running. And that can only be done by people that rely on their instincts. And usually those people happen to have some sort of artistic bent. Because those people are the ones who are willing to make something, make a decision, try, fail, execute again. It's amazing this thing even succeeded. Most people thought it wouldn't. That's OK. Um, the next thing to sort of remember with gutter technology is to solve problems without technology. Uh, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm sort of the closest thing you can find to probably a Luddite, maybe Nick Pinkston, maybe you're, you're up there too, but um, I'm a, uh, I'd rather be hiking than using my computer, right? Ideally, that's my goal, is to get away from that thing. However, 
So, okay, so I work with technology because technology becomes a way to solve certain problems. I care about communication. I don't care about gizmos. I don't care about technologies or iPads. Uh, I really don't. Um, so what that means is a lot of problems in this world that you are trying to solve can be solved without technology or with small pieces of technology. And if you think about the problem first, you can ignore the technology solution, which may be boring and may actually not solve the problem. To give you an example, uh, I taught an art class uh, here for a while when um, students were asked to figure out, a student had this project, you know, what I really want to do is I want to be able to walk into, or I want people to walk into this interactive space, and when they walk in, I want to have some audio triggered in different spaces of the room. And to do that, I need an ADBIO board that's $250. I need to be running like max MSP, and they list off the things that they need, right? And their list of needs is $1,000 worth of crap that's been designed for them to build an interactive art project. The same project could be created with two pieces of copper, a piece of foam, a wire, and a cassette player from the thrift store, about $5, because I've seen artists pull off that project. I did it when I was an undergrad, right? This is how you solve a problem with limited technology. If people, uh, when we're given too much access to tools that solve problems for us, we, we too quickly sort of jump to these tools and forget about obvious solutions. Obvious is okay. Um, this is me running. This is a very embarrassing picture. Um, this is the most critical thing is, so what I've just described to you is a process that results in a lot of failure, results in a high amount of risk, results in a business plan that people think will fail. I was told repeatedly that my company would fail, that you cannot do this with a business. Uh, we still might fail, but you know, we're trying. Um, but I only, you can only do this and take this risk if you also find something else that gives you small rewards. When you take on challenges that are big, that are hard to gauge whether you've succeeded or failed at it, um, you need to find other things in your life that will give you a sense of success or failure. These big rocks, right? You need to find those big rocks. For me, it's running. I need to go out and run because I know I can finish that because it takes three miles and I'm done in whatever amount of time I'm done in. It's a finished thing. You have to finish something. Um, so all I'm going to end with is an explanation of why gutter tech should matter at all to you, why thinking in this way should matter. If you're a company, it does. If you're not, again, as I've said, this is in my experience, take it or leave it. Um, what we do is very much, if you look at these, are these are processes that are done by artists, not necessarily by companies. We have no roles. We ignore these roles. Um, we do everything together. We treat our own work as we do client work. Um, technology is used as, as, as a last resort. We don't start by thinking about what the tool can do for us. We bring in artists and as many people from outside perspectives as possible, and we leave the office as much as possible. We play sports together. We sponsor things that have nothing to do with us. We sponsor sporting activities that we can go out and play together because we want to play together. All of our thinking, our innovation comes outside of the office, outside of sitting in a studio. And each person direct, works strictly with clients. Everyone that I work with is built so that they can be an entrepreneur on their own. They are miniature entrepreneurs when we work together. Um, Chloe with her liege waffles, uh, Ime with his iPhone application. So um, that's really all I have for you. But um, thanks for uh, allowing me to talk. <laughs>